This is me, and I'm coming back to you. Hello, everybody. This is Robin O'Neill, and I love my theme music, Royalty Free Hip Hop, from YouTube. Uh, I believe the guy's name is Otis, Otis McDonald. Um, I've heard not this song, but I've heard other tracks of his on YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, I can't remember which ones, yarn tutorials or some shit like that. Anyway, I'm a huge Otis McDonald fan. I'm fascinated by these musicians who allow you to just take their music for fun. And I thank them with all of my heart. And as you guys have noticed, I do have some more theme music for the outro track. So get ready. We're going to throw in another one at the end of this episode. <laughs> As if anyone's listening for that, but I don't know. I sit around list. I have a playlist of all of the royalty-free tracks I've gotten, and I listen to them. Uh, honestly, if I'm cleaning or cooking or something, I do. Anyway, how the hell are you guys? What's going on? What's new? I, I guess I should say Happy New Year. To me, I do feel like this is, well, obviously it's a new year, but I never get all caught up in either holidays or the new year thoughts, but I kind of am this year, to be honest with you. I feel like 2019 is going to be a vast improvement on 2018 for me. And I don't think that's going to be some miracle. I think it's because I'm going to make sure it is. So look out world. Uh, Anyway, so happy new year. And I hope it started out well. Mine has started out well, aside from, I think I got a sinus infection. So I'm going to treat myself after this to um, taking good care of myself and just kind of, I don't know, getting cozy. But uh, what else is going on? Have you noticed anything new about yourself this week as the new year came to be? Um, And was it a good thing or was it a horrifying thing? Let me see. Should I answer that? I have noticed that I'm much much braver than I ever thought. I, I, I keep encountering situations where... I don't realize that I'm brave. In fact, I I feel myself like a fearful person. I, I feel like that's how I would think about myself, but apparently that's not how people think about me. And even my parents, uh, which I never would have expected, even though they're very nice to me, they told me that I am the bravest person they know, the toughest person they know. So that was an awesome thing. So thank you, Jim and Wendy O'Neill. Um, have you gotten a good hug from somebody this week? I did from David. Thank you, David. Uh, have you avoided seeing certain people? And if so, why are you doing that? And, uh, good job doing that. (laughs) Avoidance. Just kidding. I don't think it's great. Avoidance is a bad thing. Avoidance is not good, but uh, I wouldn't say I'm avoiding anybody right now. I would say that I've been in a tough situation and have had to really... I don't know how to describe it, pare back on my um, kind of exiting my own mindscape and, and apartment and neighborhood. So I, and, um, I had to downgrade on my phone, so I'm not doing text messages. I, for a long time, I haven't had text message capabilities on my phone, and I'm sort of just doing email, and I need to, you know, I don't know. I just, I can't, I am so behind on so many things being that I had a rough year that, oh, and also I am reading this book, um, called, oh God, something like rekindling conversation, rethinking conversation. Hold on. Let me look it up. Okay. So it's reclaiming conversation, the power of talk in a digital age by Sherry Turkle. Um, So yeah, I have been reading that book, which is a frightening look at our addiction to our phones, to our smartphones. Uh, And this book, I'm not even done with it yet, but within about four pages, I was encouraged to say, I can't do this anymore. So I have another way of, you know, posting on Instagram, which frankly, I just have to do that sometimes for my job and stuff. So I have to do that. But For the most part, you know, this has always been an issue with me is I think everyone's way too connected all the time and it's really dangerous. And for me, I can tell you this, unless I'm left alone to just kind of think and make things and, you know, eat and clean and do like my regular routine, but without interruption, I can't do anything artistically. And I'm a visual artist. This is what I do. And I have a big show coming up. Speaking of, everybody's invited. 
April 25th, 2019, New York City, Susan Inglet Gallery, solo show, Robin O'Neill. I cannot wait. I want everybody to be there. And just a little, I shouldn't tease this unless I'm going to do it, but I'd kind of like to gauge you guys and your interest level. I'm thinking about doing something that would be a one night only event or one afternoon only event, a me reading stuff, some sort of, we'll call it a convention, but it's not going to be as big as a convention, but I guess you'd call it a meetup or something like that, as dorky as that sounds, in Manhattan on on like the day before my show or the day after my show or the Saturday after my show or something like that. So that week of April, April, April 25th, Manhattan, who's in? Let's meet at the Olive Garden in Times Square. What do you say? Let's do this. <laughs> I'm actually really excited about it. Anyway, you guys... Um, I'm gonna answer a few of your questions. Thank you again for all the questions. I haven't heard from Sammy, but Sammy, you won. We're we're definitely gonna contact you and get you your prize, but I'm so sorry, We I, I just forgot to contact the winner. So Sammy, you won. Um, everyone else, you win too, because you're very nice. I'm gonna answer this question from Jennifer. If you could never touch a pencil again, what would you use to create visual art? All right, let me think about that while I sip my tea. I'm, I'm pulling back so you don't have to hear me swallow really loud. I'm a loud swallower, swallower, I feel. And let's face it, no one likes listening to people swallow, do you? Is there a job where you have to listen to someone swallow? Is that an ear, nose, and throat doctor? Do they ever have to do that? Um, if I couldn't, Jennifer, thank you for your question. If I could never touch a pencil again, what would I use to create visual art? You know, I'm actually pretty sure, so I'm trained as a painter. I started oil painting when I was really young. My grandma taught me to paint with oils when I was five and I loved it. And I was always a painter for a long time. Then I did some sculpture too and all this stuff. And then I landed on pencil obviously and loved it. Um, but I will tell you that my love of textiles has really emerged here in the last year. So. I think I would use, I would do some sort of weaving with thread and yarn to make art. I think I would do really large weavings, even, or, or just stick with, you know, tapestry and make rugs, um, you know, utilitarian rugs, but make them beautiful. And that's actually something I really want to do anyway. So I'm glad you brought it up, Jennifer. This is now I'm outing myself as somebody who wants to make textiles of some sort. And, you know, I crochet, I'm going to be posting soon images of this big um, Afghan I've been making. I've been making two Afghans and they're both almost done. And oh my God, it has, get, it has been a really important part of my life making this these Afghans and getting back into crocheting. And I love yarn. So I think that's what I would say is tapestries. Um, yeah, I, but I'm not very technically great at any of this. That's the problem um, is that, you know, that takes a lot of skill, but I think the way I would do it, it would, you know, I think I could, I honestly think I could do it. I've also been interested in tile design. I don't know why, but my mom and I used to fantasize about having a tile company <laughs> for some reason. Uh, so something in that realm is kind of what I was thinking. Okay, let's see. What's the next question? Oh, from Lindsay. What is your favorite kind of rain? Lindsay? Thank you for asking. First of all, we all know I love rain. I don't know who knows this, but I know really well that I love rain and I miss rain a great deal living in dumb Los Angeles. My favorite kind of rain is serious stormy rain, like downpour rain, thunder, lightning, sheets of rain like Houston, Texas gets. Uh, that's the kind of rain I love the most. Does, is that a type of rain? I would say sheets of rain, just you are soaking wet if you're even in it for one second. This sort of misty, gentle rain that we get here occasionally, no thank you. Not at all worth my time. Okay, that's it for the questions. I, I could, I've could, i got a lot more questions to answer, and you guys keep coming with your questions. You just write to David or me at me reading stuff at iCloud.com. I think that's it. Me reading stuff at iCloud.com. That's pretty much, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay. Are you ready for me to read to you something? Now I've read from this book before. It's a little different than what we normally do, but this is Daily Rituals, a book by Mason Curry. It's a book with little descriptions of how artists work, like what they do in their studio. All kinds of artists 
artists, writers, you name it, they're in here, playwrights. And this book is from, I almost said from ISBN. Uh, it does have an ISBN number, don't worry about it. Uh, it's a Borzoi book published by Alfred A. Knopf in 2013. Okay, so I've read from here many times. These are just artists, you know, and their rituals. I'm going to read to you. I'm going to start with Anne Beatty. Beatty, sorry, Ann Beatty, born in 1947. I don't know if I've read her on here, but I've talked about her before. Here we go. Beatty works best at night. Quote, I really believe in day people and night people. End quote. She told an interviewer in 1980. Uh, first of all, word, Ann Beatty. Me too, and guess what I am? I'm a night person. I was born at night. I exist at night. I hate the day. And I'm not even goth, but I do despise daylight. I, I, don't, I just don't get into it until it's sunset. I love a sunset, and then I like the darkness. Anyway, here's a quote from Ann B. I really think people's bodies are on different clocks. By the way, that's medically proven. So my doctor, who knows everything in the world, tells me that. Like, you cannot fuck with it. If you feel best working from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., then you better do that or you're never going to be good at what you do. If you work best from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. and the rest of the day you're a piece of shit, well, good. At least you've got those couple of hours because it's just how it goes. I mean, people just are built certain ways and you got to accept how you're built. Anyway, okay, back to Ann Beatty. I really think people's bodies are on different clocks. I even feel now like I just woke up and I've been awake for three or four hours. And I'll feel this way until seven o'clock tonight when I'll start to pick up and then by nine it'll be okay to start writing. My favorite hours are from 12 to 3 a.m. for writing. That's awesome. So yeah, I would say my favorite hours for making art are from about 7.30 p.m. until about 3 a.m. That's like my ideal time is when my brain's most alive. Anyway, she doesn't write every night, however. I really don't adhere to schedules at all. I don't have the slightest desire to do that, she said. The times that I've tried that, when I've been in a slump and I try to get out of it by saying, come on, Anne, sit down at that typewriter. I've gotten in a worse slump. It's better if I just let it ride. As a result, she often won't write anything for months. I've learned I can't force it. But that doesn't mean that she is able to relax, isn't able, sorry. But that doesn't mean that she is able to relax and enjoy herself during these fallow periods. Rather, she says it's like having an almost permanent case of writer's block. As she told an interviewer in 1998, I certainly am a moody and, I would say, not very happy person. Well, there you go. I like her honesty. I like the directness. I also love Flannery O'Connor. So we're going to read her. Flannery O'Connor. Everybody knows her. After being diagnosed with lupus in 1951, and she told what Anne told she would live only another four years, O'Connor returned to her native Georgia and moved in with her mother at the family farm in rural Andalusia. Years later, a writing instructor had advised O'Connor to set aside a certain number of hours each day to write, and she had taken his advice to heart. Back in Georgia, she came to believe, as she wrote to a friend, that, quote, routine is a condition of survival. A devout Catholic, O'Connor, uh, sorry, but I love that these two women have completely different approaches. And ag this is again to say, you got to do it your way. Forget what other people are telling you and all these apps that have time management timers on them to get you pumped up or whatever the sleep app is and all this shit. No. How about you listen to yourself? How about that, people? All right. Why am I so angry tonight? I'm like yelling at you guys and I don't mean to. I think... I just don't feel well, honestly, but that's no excuse. I'm sorry. You guys know that I don't want to yell at you. All right, here we go. A devout Catholic, O'Connor began each day at 6 a.m. with morning prayers from her copy of A Short Breviary. Then she joined her mother in the kitchen where they would share a thermos of coffee while listening to the weather report on the radio. Morning mass was at 7, a short drive into town at the Sacred Heart. Her religious obligations fulfilled, O'Connor would turn to her writing, shutting herself away between 9 a.m. and noon for her daily three hours, which would typically yield three pages. Although, she told a reporter, I may tear it all to pieces the next day. By the afternoon, O'Connor's energy was spent. The lupus caused her to tire early and experience flu-like symptoms and mental fogginess as the day wore on. 
She passed these hours receiving visitors on the porch and pursuing her hobbies of painting and raising birds, peacocks, which she loved and also often incorporated into her stories, as well as ducks, hens, and geese. By sundown, she was ready for bed. I go to bed at nine and I'm always glad to get there, she wrote. Before bedtime, she might recite another prayer from her breviary, but her usual nighttime reading was a 700-page volume of Thomas Aquinas. I read a lot of theology because it makes my writing bolder, she said. And that's it. I like how she said, I go to bed at nine and I'm always glad to get there. How do you guys feel about sleep? You like it? You hate it? It's just a necessary part of life or do you live for it? I live for it. There's nothing I love more than sleeping other than Ann Carson. And I'm going to read you another Ann Carson. Actually, sorry, Ann Carson. I love sleeping more than I love you. I'm going to read something from a back issue of The New Yorker um, from Ann Carson. This is from August 10th. uh, Let's see. The 2015 issue. All right. It's called Each Day Unexpected Salvation, John Cage. Now, I, P.S., I got to hear her recite this as a, in the middle of a whole bunch of other things at the UCLA's um, Hammer Museum, and it was really one of the most, uh, I don't know, mind-blowing events I've ever seen. So I can put a link in the description of the podcast where you can get, uh, you can actually watch the video of that, that lecture and performance or whatever it is, and um, also this book, Daily Rituals. So here is Each Day Unexpected Salvation. Forest shade, lake shade, poplar shade, highway shade, backyard shade, cafe shade, down behind the school shade, cow shade, carport shade, blowing shade, dappled shade, shade darkened by rain above, shade under ships, Shade along banks of snow. Shade beneath the one tree in a bright place. Shade by the ice cream truck. Shade in the new car sales room. Shade in halls of the palace as all the electric lights turn on. Shade in a stairwell. Shade in tea barrels. Shade in books. Shade of clouds running over a distant landscape. Shade on bales in the barn. Shade in the pantry. Shade in the ice house, the smell of shade. Shade under runner blades, shade along branches. Shade at night, a difficult research. Shade on rungs of a ladder. Shade on pats of butter sculpted to look like scallop shells. Shade to holler from, shade in the chill of bamboo. Shade at the core of an apple, confessional shade. Shade of hair salons. Shade in a joke, shade in the town hall, shade descending from legendary ancient hills, shade under the jaws of a dog with a bird in its mouth trotting along to the master's voice, shade at the back of the choir, shade in pleats, shade clinging to arrows in the quiver, shade in scars. All right. Hello. Hello, Ann Carson. I love you. Do you guys think Ann Carson will ever find out that there is some weirdo here, some weirdo visual artist obsessed with every single thing she does? Let her know. Hello, Ann Carson. We all love you. And in fact, everybody loves Ann Carson that I know. I've never met anyone who I've encouraged to read Ann Carson who didn't come back and say thank you. So that's all I have for now, my dear, sweet friends and listeners. I am going to sign out. I'm trying hard over here. I am fighting through my clogged sinuses. I am hoping you're fighting hard and also resting and breathing deeply and healing broken things, whatever may be broken for you. Um, Here's what I want. I'm going to tell you two things. I want you to do those things you want to do. And I want you to stop doing those things you don't want to do anymore. And if you can do those two simple things that I just listed, life is solved. End of story. Uh, So that's a small assignment, but a big one. So keep dying. Keep writing it down. That's C.K. Williams. I'm Robin O'Neill. I'll see you April 25th in New York City. And I love you. Good night, everybody.